Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with Canadian jazz trumpeter and composer John Korsrud of the Hard Rubber Orchestra. He talked about their new 2022 CD, Iguana. It's their fifth release in their 32nd year as a band. The Hard Rubber Orchestra was formed in 1990 by John, and they have commissioned over 50 composers, including Kenny Wheeler, Darcy James Argue, Peggy Lee, Brad Turner, Christine Jensen, and so many others. It's a great interview. Enjoy. Thank you for taking a minute out today. I appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Thank you. The Hard Rubber Orchestra, you release your fifth CD, Iguana. It's your 32nd year together. Talk to me a little bit about this coming out under the guise of COVID easing and more live shows. Just how does this release feel for you? It, it actually, in a, in a sense, it was a COVID uh, release as far as we're, we're, we're an ensemble. We've been around 32 years and what we, we perform probably three times a year. We've traveled across the country and, and did multimedia shows and all that sort of thing. Uh, and we were supposed to have a bunch of pieces uh, composed and premiered over the last couple of years. And because that couldn't happen because of no, no live concerts, of course. So we turned them into studio productions. And, uh, and even then that we, uh, I had to use musicians who had their own studio. So we, we basically just gave the parts to the musicians and they uh, recorded the parts and, um, and then sent them back to us. And then we uh, we mixed it remotely, so it really was done remotely. So it was actually quite an amazing uh, feat uh, to to do, uh, but uh, but it all got done. Talk to me a little bit about how you put this album together and what you hope the listener gets from it. Well, I mean, uh, we're always a high energy ensemble. Although our direction is uh, halfway between contemporary classical and and then one other thing. So uh, my interest is modern jazz, contemporary classical music. Um, the very first track is Harry Stapalakis. He's a new music composer. He lives in New York. Uh, he's, he's the artistic director of the Winnipeg New Music Festival. Um, and his background is heavy metal music. So, uh, you know, he's that's his kind of his love and his passion. So when you hear the first track, you definitely hear lots of, the, you know, how well he knows the, the history and the nuance of, like, heavy metal music. All the pieces are very exploratory. Uh, I'm looking for music that's kind of, um, you know, you can't be defined by genre. Uh, you can't say it's a jazz piece or it's a classical new music piece. Um, that's what I'm interested in. So all the pieces are high energy, kind of genre defined, and, um, you know, and I, that's what I hope the kind of listener is looking for that kind of music. So you guys were founded in 1990. You've been together quite a while. What has been the the key ingredient to making this an enjoyable artistic collective? Uh, well, that's a good question. I mean, from I always consider the audience in mind always. I try to do very entertaining shows. But, you know, the shows are very musically exploratory, but I always try to make entertaining shows. And um, uh, I try to create, present new music in, you know, audience friendly ways often you're doing kind of fun opera we've done ice shows we've done two ice shows i've done avant raves uh, as far as keeping the collective uh, happy uh i just hope to keep, keep the, the music at a high quality i mean we're all good friends we're all we're all, we're all located in vancouver canada and uh you know we uh, I, you know i always use the best music, musicians I can, I can get and that's uh one thing you've probably known from the other, um, you know, musicians you've worked with and talked to, musicians like playing with good musicians, and uh, that's what kind of makes it worthwhile for them. So I just try to keep the music standards as high as possible and keep the music very exploratory and kind of crazy. So talk to me a little bit about your background. How, where were you born and raised, and how did music become your passion and your profession? Yeah, thanks. Sure. Uh, well, um, I'm uh, born and raised in uh, Regina, Canada. I now live in, I've been living in Vancouver, Canada since I was uh, four years old. My dad was a huge jazz fan, part-time drummer. So right from the room, I grew up listening to Art Blakey, Miles Davis, John Coltrane, uh, Jimmy Smith, all that, all that kind of stuff. So I grew up with, you know, a real love uh, for jazz. And then... Uh, I kind of, I was always attracted to more explore. I had a very eclectic taste in music, so I loved everything. Uh, loved more kind of the crazier music. Uh, eventually, you know, dabbled in free jazz for a while, was attracted to it. But then I went to UBC to study composition at the University of British Columbia, and I was introduced to a lot of new music composers, such as uh, Ligeti and uh, Ludoslavsky and stuff like that. And then, um, I actually was able to go to Holland for a couple of years of study with a very renowned composer named Louis Andreessen, who just uh, died uh, this year, actually. Um, and 
you know, he was probably one of Europe's most recognized uh, composers. So that was um, quite the experience living in Amsterdam. And then I had a long uh, association with Amsterdam for the next 10 years. I was either going back, doing commissions, or playing trumpet. I'm a trumpet player myself. Um, and so, and then, you know, before that, I was studying new music composition at the, at the university. So I, that's kind of my background. So, um, you know, I, I never write swing, so I tend to incorporate a lot of 20th century techniques into that kind of funk music and, and things like that. And um, and when I'm writing for uh, classical ensembles, which I do, I write for a handful of uh, uh, orchestral commissions, like one, but including like the um, American Composers Orchestra in New York and uh, the Vancouver Symphony. And I try to bring in a more jazzy um, elements into that, into that music. What is it that you like the best about being a performer and being a musician? You know, I mean, it's, it's, uh, you've been at it for quite a while, but what is it that continues to bring you back and has been kind of the key to your longevity? <laughs> I was going to say, oh, I, I, I'm, I'm into it for the girls. What do you, what do you, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, gee, well, I, you know, I don't, you know, I think every musician will tell you the same thing. What do, what do I get out of it? I, well, I guess I, I, I enjoy the, the challenge of it more than anything else. You know, you know, even when I first started composing, I couldn't, I was like, why is this so difficult? And I, you know, I think that's what just kind of kept me coming back. And I, of course, just my love of music. I mean, music means everything to me. And I'm sure all of the people you interview, yeah, you would, you'll probably say the same thing, that music just means everything to them. And <clears throat> I like music that I don't understand. Um, you know, if I hear something that's, that really works, but I can't really quite figure what's going on, I'm really fascinated by that. Um, but I'm also fascinated by groove and, and things like that and anything with, with kind of momentum and input, imp, uh, that kind of impetus. And that's kind of something you can't define and you can't, can't even intellectualize it very much. And um, so I, I'm attracted to those kind of things. I just, you know, I just, like you said, I just love music more than anything. And I love music that challenges me. And, um, you know, in the same way when I play trumpet, you know, I just go, why is this thing so difficult? You know, why can't I, you know, I, and, um, you know, to come golf a couple of years ago, too, the same thing. It's like, why can't I hit this ball? So, you know, I think it's those kind of things just kind of keep, keep you coming back. So if you could get into a time machine or a jazz DeLorean and go back in time and see a musician, anybody in the history of jazz, who are you going to go see? Where are you going to go? Jazz DeLorean. Wow. Uh, are those nice nice looks? Uh, gee, that's a good question. Uh, well, gosh, uh, I think Clifford Brown would be amazing. You know, he, he, he died so young, 24 or 26 or something like that. And I think, you know, or Miles with the, um, with the, uh, Herb, the Herbie band, that, you know, that one would be, it would be amazing. Um, you know, Coltrane, of course, you know, with, with, with the great quartet, you know, you, you hear all those, all those kind of stories. Um, would, 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 you, do you, have you asked that question amongst others? What do what what most people say when, they, when, they, when you ask them that? The number one answer is always Coltrane. I mean, like, right. out of everybody, it's always kind of Coltrane. But, you know, there's interesting variations on it. I mean, even Lu even Louis Armstrong's a pretty big one because that was kind of the beginning mm -hmm. and the birth of things. But um, I think a lot of it kind of resonates around that golden era of jazz with Miles and... I mean, even Clifford and and all of those cats. That's that's pretty common for an answer. Yeah, I can I, 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 I can see that. I can see the culture. Because you know, I, I remember talking to someone else. Who was I talking? It was David Lehman was, it was saying he, that he would see them in Seattle, and he, he said by you know just the, the energy of the band that everyone in the club would all be on their feet, like just standing. He wouldn't even remember it standing up. It's that you know the energy just kept building and building and building. And suddenly everyone's on their feet and and. Uh, you know, he, they just seem to have that 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 kind of power. You know, and and uh, and, and just the uh, originality of the band at the time. I mean, who, who, who was doing that? You know, no one really. Um, so I, I can definitely see that being a common a common answer. Uh, um, and, and Louis, I mean, I I'm personally not a huge Louis Armstrong fan. Um, not that there's anything wrong with him, but my my taste kind of go towards like the later more experimental uh, side of jazz, like, like in like late 60s, mid 60s, or, or around there. You know, the, one of the reasons why I actually even came up with this question was all of the times that I've been down on 18th and Vine, and I just, I, when I drive through that district, there's so much history, you know, going to the Mutual Musicians Foundation, about every musician that was alive 
for a span of like 70 to 80 years came through and played at some club somewhere in Kansas City. And I thought, you know, even about Bird, like if you could catch him in the early days. So it's like sometimes I feel like I'm swimming through ghosts when I get down in that district. And I think it's just interesting to see how people would navigate their time machine. Um, so yeah, I think Shawnee Parker would actually be a, be a big one too. I think for a lot of people, you know, yeah. I, would, I would think that. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. So are there any, are there any kind of sorry, I'm kind of interviewing you. What, what kind of mementos or uh, monuments are, are in Can- or, or Kansas for for Tony Parker? There must be some some things there. Well, down on 18 and Vine, they have a big statue, kind of a, a bust of him, his head, and behind him is the city. Um, you know, the, the the grave is there um, in Highland Park, um, and they every August they have the Charlie Parker celebration for his birthday, and they'll do a procession that will go from there, and it'll wind its way through 18 and Vine, and kind of it's and then all of the clubs in the area will will do a little, uh, uh, we'll have a whole variety of shows, but yeah, those are two of the biggest markers for him that are here. Yeah. So is that kind of a jazz destination, like for musicians, like it's a tourist destination where like tourists come for those for, for those for that for the birthday celebrations? Yeah, they do, and we do have the American Jazz Museum, and that's a pretty big draw, and that's right next to the Negro Leagues Baseball Hall of Fame Museum as well. So that's kind of a destination out there on 18 and Vine, and of course we have the Blue Room, which is right next to the Jazz Museum. So I think so. I mean, Kansas City has the barbecue. We have a lot of fountains, um, and you know the jazz, of course, is is world famous. So yeah, I think a lot of those things pull people in. Right, and how's the scene there? The very, it must be a very active active scene there. It must be a, big, a great jazz city still, I'd imagine. Yeah, it it really actually is. You know, you I mean, there was a time where it would ebb and flow, but now it's pretty consistent. There's a a good amount of clubs every night. You look at the jazz calendar; it's flush with acts and performances and people are coming into town so um cool. yeah it's good cool. or can you maybe mention a few names of like the last 30 years anybody who's kind of gone on to new york to make names of themselves from from kansas, kansas uh City? Lo- logan richardson is a big one and he went to new york went to paris and i think he's in la now um harold o'neill is another one that's from here and he went to new york and herman Bahari is in paris now He's, he did a lot of work here. The great Bob Bowman, the bassist, was um, he was in L.A. for a while. He came back here. He's in Montana now, but he actually spent a lot of time here. Um, Todd Strait was in Portland for a while. He came back here. But, you know, it, people kind of bounce back and forth. But, yeah, there's, you know, Bobby Watson uh, headed up the UMKC program here for quite a while. He retired a few years ago. Is that um, Bobby Watson, the, the, uh, the, the, the saxophone player? Yes, yeah. Yeah. And, but, you know, there's a lot of people that are coming here now, you know, instead of this being like an educational springboard or a place where people, you know, decide they want to kind of test the waters and go to a bigger place. Kansas City has been a place where people are coming. I mean, we, you know, Adam Larson's here. There's a lot of people that have come here. I guess Vancouver has his own uh, handful of expats who have gone to New York and do it. Ingrid Jensen, do you know Ingrid? Absolutely. And um, Seamus Blake? Yep. You know, Seamus and uh, Michael Blake. You may not know, but he was he was doing well for a while. Michael Blake. Yeah. And um, uh, let's see. Uh, Michael Bublé is from here, and uh, um, uh, Diana Krall is from here. Yeah. Um, so you know, I guess we've we've had our own. You know, some talent has gone. Uh, yeah, Renee um, Renee Rosnes is from here. Oh wow! Yeah. 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 So so quite a few. You know, a good handful of the musicians from Vancouver too. Absolutely. Yeah. Well. Let me ask you this. Why do you love jazz? <laughs> uh, well, geez. Uh, well, I like complex music. Uh, I, it was the music that I first heard as a kid. I mean, I love fast, complex music, but I also love early music, too. I love very kind of minimalist uh, kind of music. I guess I like extremes. I like that it's exploratory. I like that it's um, everyone can put their own mark on things. Uh, you know, I like the classic jazz too, like you know the Dexter Gordon and all, all that kind of stuff. I also like knowing what's next on the horizon, and you know, I'm always trying to be a little bit ahead of the curve. And I'm uh, my music, I try to keep. Uh, I always try to be a little bit ahead. Of the, I try to do something no one else has done. So I try to write music I've never done before, and also no one else has done, which is and try to make it still be good music. Um, 
as far as why I like jazz, I mean, and jazz is just a, it's such an un, undefinable term, anyways. Like, I mean, it doesn't really mean anything these days, does it? I mean, um, I mean, there's just as many kinds of jazz as there are. Like, heavy, heavy, if you ask a heavy metal person what kind of heavy metal music they like, there's like there's like twenty seven thousand different kinds, and I think jazz is, is the same thing. Uh, yeah, I guess our music, the Harper Orchestra, is fairly avant, uh, to, to use that term, but it's more comp- it's always composition based. It, these are all like uh, based around composers and things like that, and trying to, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I, even though I employ jazz musicians, I wouldn't call our band a jazz band. Um, I guess you know, um, but I, I employ jazz musicians because they're well rounded. They can play funk, they can play rock, they can play free. You know, they, they're good readers, um, and they, you know, they generally have open, you know, very good open minds. I also employ some classical musicians uh, as well, because who have a background in Nick, new new music. Um. <laughs> yeah, no, that's good. That's good. I And I was going to follow that up with, with a little bit more about you, and, you know, everyone has a perception of you, an idea of who they think you are, your family, your friends, your fans, but ultimately you live your life. Who do you think you are? Well, I try to just do as good as I can as far as I try to make good music, and especially now that the world is kind of crumbling apart uh, a, a little bit. Um, I realize the best thing I can do is just try to make the world better in my immediate surroundings. So I'm just trying to make, make, make music, and I try to support other people's music, and I support other people's creativity. You know, I, I do a lot of volunteering in, around Vancouver and try to create uh, music for other people and for, for ourselves. And I'm always looking to find places and venues where we can put music in and um you know i'm also an educator i I teach i play trumpet i produce concerts i compose um you know i think my 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 tastes are pretty uh far-reaching um john this has been great man thank you for opening up i appreciate your time good luck with the album and the return to the stage and everything else that comes your way this year Thank you, Joy. I really appreciate the call. Thanks for listening and tuning into another Neon Jazz interview. We give you a bit of insight into the finest players and minds and bands in Canada, Kansas City, and spots all over the world, giving fans all that jazz. Thanks to John for his time, music, and story. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino in the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com. And for everything Neon Jazz, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. For all things Joe Domino, visit joedomino.com, and there you can kick in via Patreon or PayPal. Until next time. Enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.